we have a very interesting program for videotape this morning. Uh, a number of gentlemen have found it uh, perhaps inconvenient to come in this morning and talk about their reflections of civic uh, life in Framingham. The program is entitled Reflections of Civic Leaders. They are all leaders in Framingham and have been for many years. I'd first like to introduce Mr. Peter Ablondi over here, who is Secretary of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, Mr. Ablondi, do you have a few words to say for the uh, well, Mr. videotape? Pratt, a slight correction. Uh, I'm not the Secretary of the Board of Selectmen. I just am a member of the Board of Selectmen and have been for seven years. And I find my job very interesting, very challenging, and I must say at times very frustrating. The problems of today, 1975, I find, are no different than they were in 1920. I spent many hours in going over the early reports, and the problems that bothered the selectmen then bother us today, well, taxes, you. unemployment, and you can name it. I so, think that's right. Thank you, Mr. Bondi. Uh, Mr. Winston Anderson and, uh, is uh, a member of the school committee in Framingham. And Mr. Anderson, how about some interesting things about your activity in Framingham? Well, I grew up on Salem End Road, and uh, I mention that because it's related to the present-day problem with the buses. We walked down through the woods to the country club and took the trolley car down to Framingham Center. And we went to school at the Jonathan Maynard School. Ralph Newland and I went to the Jonathan Maynard School. It was brand new. Uh, they, we had Previous to that, we'd had a series of district schools, starting with district number one, which was the central school at Framingham Center. And there was a Hardy district school over in the Newbury Street area. There was a Saxonville school. There was a school in Knobscott, and I don't remember the number, but up uh, Edmonds Road at the corner of Nixon Road, they had the number seven school. Up Salem End Road at the corner of Parker Road, there was a school in there, it was the number five district school. This was a one-room district school. It had a uh, student manned heater. That is, they cut the wood and yeah. lit the fire yeah. and maintained the well, Yeah, those will be interesting things. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Carl Sheridan, who is, uh, has been a moderator in the town for 15 years and is chairman of the Permanent School Construction Committee. Well, at the present time, uh, We've just let the contract for the renovation in addition to the Saxonville Elementary School. And we're in the process of finishing up the three middle schools that have been constructed and are now occupied. And uh, besides that, uh, I've been born and brought up in town and in law practice here. Thank you, Mr. Sheridan. Mr. John Murtaugh, uh, Chairman of Veterans Services. Well, I've been in Framingham since 1926, and I've watched the veteran population in Framingham grow. Uh, we started out after World War II. We had a population of, uh, veteran population of 4,500, and that's who enlisted. And uh, we picked up 2,300 in the Vietnam War and 3,000 in the Korean, and Vietnam, I think, was three. And we had uh, 2,000 in World War I. We have a great popula veteran population in Framingham. And I find that the newer veterans that are coming out are taking much greater advantage of the educational benefits. And uh, all of a sudden, there has been a great change to on-the-job on training and apprentice training with the veterans. Mr. Murtaugh, Mr. Primo Silva, Director of Public Works. It's uh, been quite an interesting life for me to be part of the growth of Framingham. Public Works covers many facets of the expansion of the town. Your water, your sewer, your highways, your sidewalks. Uh, and by all of this, it means then that uh, the town has had to appropriate money. Uh, facilities and uh, of our utilities had to grow with the growth of the town. And as I said, uh, it definitely has been a very interesting growth for, for me. Thank you. Um, thank you. Mr. Ralph Noonan, Executive Sec Secretary for the Board of Selectmen. 
Well, I've lived in Framingham for 62 years, and my mother's family arrived in Framingham well over a hundred years ago, and I went all through the school system here in Framingham, and as Andy has mentioned, we went all through the Jonathan Maynard together, and then I followed Carl Sheridan by a couple of years in high school, and I think I was pushed around the football field more than once by Mr. Sheridan. I have been on the finance committee, and I have been town moderator presiding over the town meeting for five years, and I am now serving as executive secretary as a member of Mr. Ablondi's Boy Scout Troop. <laughs> okay, thank you, gentlemen, for introducing yourselves. Uh, I'm going to throw out first a, a question about Framingham history and, and perhaps your part in it, having to do with uh, public works. I barely remember myself the horse-drawn vehicles. Mr. Silva, how about it? Soon after World War I, perhaps. Was there a problem with public works, with automobiles? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, the problems that we have today, uh, they make so much of them now, where back years ago, uh, the problems didn't appear to be uh, as bad because everybody pitched in and, and uh, seemed to help out and to cope with what was wrong. Now, a very vivid picture that I can remember is the, uh, uh, the roller that they used to pull on streets to roll down the snow so that the pungs would ride, uh, ride pr uh, more uh, easily on the streets. And the reason for the, the rollers going there, they were packing it down so that the snow would remain on the streets rather than the snow being pushed off. Uh, this was to take and cope with the horse-drawn uh, 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 means of, tra of uh, traveling. Uh, Mr. Noonan pointed out to me that I believe in, uh, sometime in 1922 or 23, the snow and ice, ice account at that time was $11,500. Three years ago, we had a snow and ice account of $567,000. Uh, Public Works, as I said earlier, it has been a very, very interesting uh, phase in Framingham uh, street construction. One of the first streets that were constructed was Route, Route 30, now known uh, as Pleasant Street. Uh, uh, that was one of the first uh, vehicle uh, ter traveling streets because uh, it, it was getting people from town to town. Uh, Route 9 at that time was the Boston and Worcester Railroad tracks. Uh, 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 believe it or not, that right up until 1930, uh, 19, yeah, 1930, that uh, Route 9, as now known, was still a graveled road. Uh, now, that is, uh, thinking of the intersection of Pleasant Street and Route 9 uh, at the Framium Center, there's been a big political problem, I know, in that, uh, in that area. Well, the intersection at uh, Route 9 and uh, Union Avenue or Main Street at that time, instead of being an intersection for uh, uh, for automobiles and trucks, it was an intersection for streetcars. This is where the streetcars would shift to go to Framingham, and they would proceed further along in Framingham. And uh, uh, at that at that particular time, uh, uh, the hill, or what they call the, uh, the normal hill, actually came over to the edge of the parking lot in front of the stores. So actually, uh, the, there's been one tremendous uh, change in that area. Now, uh, uh, back in uh, back in 1927 to 28, uh, the state decided to construct Route 9, and uh, they started in making building sections of Route 9. Uh, I, I think that uh, I'll have to go along and leave uh, the street construction at this particular point and say that we also had to take and be concerned, or public works had to be concerned about uh, the extent of uh, the, uh, the uh, well, uh, uh, Before we get off that, uh, Mr. Silva, I think Mr. Noonan had a comment to make something about uh, the roads, perhaps. Well, uh, to nine. clarify what Primo said about uh, Framingham <laughs> Center, it may be interesting that across the street from the Travis drugstore, where Travis's drugstore is now, there was a complete uh, block through there with a number of stores. Mm -hmm. And that was all demolished about 1927, 1930. And as I remember, the bank was up there. The original quarters of the uh, National Bank was up in Framingham Center. And then when the railroad came through Framingham, 
It moved to downtown Framingham. But one of Mr. Silver's favorite haunts in those days was the sure. Hunt Candy Factory that was up on the side of the hill. And if you were a nice boy, you could occasionally get a handout up there. And I'm sure Mr. Anderson joined to Mr. Silver and myself on more than one occasion looking for a handout from Hunt's Candy Factory. <laughs> yes, and if I might add, uh, Mr. Hunt had a pretty daughter that we went to see. The candy, I think, was secondary. Well, Mr. Anderson is younger than the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> About 20 minutes. <laughs> Steve, back so in the day, so there was a, uh, a maiden lady who ran a store, Miss Moulton, yes, who was, was quite Moulton. a celebrity in Framingham Center. Those of us who were born and grew up in Framingham Center can never forget Miss Moulton. Matter of fact, I became a newsboy at the tender age of 12. It came about because of my end of the town, uh, many of the uh, people who lived there, uh, either they had a servant to go downtown to get the newspaper, or they had to walk. And uh, I recall I was in the store one afternoon, she asked me if I wanted to become a newsboy. Well, without thinking, I said yes. Well, I'll leave it to you now to guess how many customers I had in that route. And those five customers were spread over an area a mile in length. And I, I might say uh, an area of four square miles. And I collected for that the sum of five cents a day. And Steve, I was happy to do it. Steve, I this think you ought to get Mr. Blondy to comment on the Central House, too, on Mr. Anderson. I, I'd like well, to comment understand. on the Central, Central House. House. Okay, Mr. Anderson, what about yeah. the Central House? The Central House was situated b about where the library stands now. And if you don't know which is the library, it looks like a Greyhound bus station. Uh, the Central House and the Chinese Laundry and Rule Strong's Market were right there, and it was rumored that the Central House sold liquor despite the prohibition. And, of course, there were nights when we waited there for the trolley car to go home, and it was supposed to be a bad atmosphere, no matter what the weather, if we went and stood on the veranda of the Central House. It was a wooden two-story building, and. Uh, I think they put the wallpaper up and then they put the boards up. But, uh, it was uh, quite a place. Steve, to go back now, the reason that Central House is there, it was mentioned earlier that uh, Route 9 was the uh, main travel route between Boston and Worcester. That is correct. That's the old turnpike. And for the people who don't realize it, the turnpike at the, on that day, when you go up Route 9 and you go down Old Worcester Road, which now is just dead-ended at the reservoir. That was the main route. And I recall one summer, reservoir number three had to have some stonework done on its dam, so they allowed the water to be drained out. And there was the old original road that right through where the island is. In other words, to pinpoint it exactly, where the Red Coach Grill was the western terminus of the road that is now buried underwater. Now, the Central House was, in those days, the stagecoach stuff. Boston, Framingham, 21 miles, and uh, the weary traveler could stay there for lunch or dinner or overnight. Yeah. And that goes back uh, a little bit before our time. I'll do it. Interesting. Well, you're going back down to uh, Beacon Street and Old Connecticut Path. The Hastings ran the blacksmith shop there for the repairs of the coaches coming from yeah. Boston to New York. Uh, they had that whole area in there. Yeah, the transportation, the whole thing of transportation is important for Framingham. The railroads, of yeah. course, once we get down yeah, south Framingham. Yeah, a little red building there with a blacksmith shop was right and at the corner of uh, Constituent Road and Beacon. Near the Hastings School. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Steve, uh, Primo mentioned earlier about uh, the days of uh, early uh, road construction. My memory goes back uh, to when the Boston and Worcester Railroad decided to double track their railroad from Framingham Center to the South Pole Line. And uh, uh, I also recall that they plowed what we call today the westbound lane of Route 9 by means of having a boom swinging out from what we call the battleship cars. And it had a very loud whistle to warn the puns up ahead to get out of the way and coming to plow the road. And many is the time the pound would have to pull aside, and it was on a retractable basis. And it was, we kids were fascinated to see that iron move back and forth, plowing the snow. Yeah. Now, 
We noticed this morning, right there where the railroad track crosses Route 9, Framingham Center, there are two little buildings, one on either side of the tracks. It looks as though they've been there for hundreds of years. Oh, no. Oh, no. 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 There was a big railroad station up in Framingham Center, uh, right on the Maynard Road. Yeah. And the uh, trains used to come up there, oh, six or eight trains a day, uh, going up to Fitchburg and going up to Lowell. And that building, the small building that you see there now, Steve, replaced the original railroad station and the big tower station was up at the end of what is now known as uh, Tower Street. The Y. Yeah. And, that, and the Y before the uh, Fitchburg and Lowell tracks split. And uh, when uh, the tower was destroyed and the, the uh, railroad station was there, knocked down, and this small building replaced it. But in the old days, and I've got to go back to the state college now, or in those days, the normal school, that was an extremely active station. When the girls, when their trunks and baggage arrived there in the spring of the, in the fall of the year, and again in the uh, uh, spring of the year, and I think as Andy, you check me out on this, but I think it was the Drake family that were the uh, baggage masters, the and, yeah. and they lived over on Winter Street uh, in the area where now the uh, Grain building is, or what? I don't know what. No, it, it was on Winter Street, uh, 29 Winter Street, I think mm -hmm. it was. But uh, there's one thing that I think that Ralph left out. He covered pretty well, except for Chenery's Coal Yard. A couple of those small buildings that you may refer to came from Chenery's Coal Yard, and he, he wore a, a high three inch collar, and he played the organ in the Unitarian Church. And, and never he was, married. Never married. Oh, no. When he built a house, he built a a uh, house on Adams Road, and he had the first house in Framingham with an elevator in it. <laughs> Chenry lived originally, Andy, where the Wayside Inn, correct, right. motel is today. Yeah. I think, uh, Steve, the house you referred to was now used by the railroad crossing tender, because being a, a main uh, uh, road, all buses have to stop there, and uh, we have two trains a day, freight now. And is someone in one of those buildings also? There's a gate crossing tender there. Yeah. Let me go back now. The first train ride that I made from Framingham to Boston, believe it or not, I was up to take the 720 train out of Framingham Center, which is the New Haven line, downtown Framingham, two miles away, connecting with the Boston and Albany into Boston. And when I, st when I went to work in Boston, starting in 1921, I would get on that train in the morning, go right to the South Station, and if I took the 501 train out of the South Station, I could get off that train at night because it was a direct train from Boston to Marlboro. Passenger service was discontinued by the railroad in the Framingham Center Line around 1926 or 27. I hadn't known it. Now, thinking of the railroads uh, and uh, thinking of downtown Framingham, all you gentlemen, I know Mr. Sheridan uh, was moderator for 15 years. There's always been a problem with the crossing down in, in what they used to call South Framingham. Mr. Sheridan, can you remember the big problems that you encountered? Well, yeah, there's always, there's always been a problem as far as our crossing is concerned. Uh, of course, the, originally uh, the train was going to go through Framingham Center, but there was so much objection there that they, they moved the train location to what we call South Framingham. And immediately when the train service went through there, then they built up all around the railroad tracks. And Framingham, to, South Framingham developed, uh, but we always used to call it South Framingham and Framingham Center. Then we've had these studies for about 75 years on the committee studying the railroad crossing. And uh, there was a committee which I appointed uh, uh, when I was moderator to, that made a study of this. And at that time, uh, we had some cooperation from the railroad and from public works. And that committee came up with a plan which I thought at that time was, was very sensible, and, and but the town meeting voted down so that uh, we have nothing. So the, the, the crossing is still there. <laughs> and uh, I imagine it still will be there unless uh, the town can get together because when I was in public works, You'd have these propositions come in there, and then you'd have another group come in in opposition, and uh, uh, so we just shelved it in 
until they can get together and decide something, we, we weren't going to spend any money on it. Must be some other good comments from you, gentlemen, about yeah. that situation. I'd like to I'd like to comment on it to Thanks. say that I heard Bernard Merriam, who was affectionately known as Whiskers Merriam, to uh, differentiate between him and his brother John, who was a lawyer and the moderator. Uh, he he said that he had been connected. And he said this at a town meeting. He had been connected with the removal of that grade crossing for 50 years. And he hoped that something, that was at the time when Mr. Sheridan mentions that it looked like maybe we could do something. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Sheridan was more charitable than I'm going to be. There was one of our local attorneys is also a real estate owner, and this new location of the railroad would have gone through his property. And one of the members of the Board of Selectmen had a father, a very eminent, well-respected man, who lived in the past, and he had horses up, up until very recently down on Oak Street Terrace, and he didn't want his disturbed. And it was a question of not of merit. The merit, as Mr. Sheridan indicates, indicated that it should go through. But there were personalities and property <coughs> rights involved, and they pulled the strings and stopped the thing. Let me comment further yes. on that. Uh, because of Operation 275, I've been involved on that railroad <coughs> crossing problem. And in doing some research, I find the first recorded word about a problem in the 1890 Annual Town Report. And it then said that we had better recognize there is a problem and we had better start doing something about it. Well, I've done a lot of research since then, and my latest find is... You might say that up until about 1945 or 6, either every year or every alternate year, there was a report. And some of them are very interesting if you read the early reports, what the committee had done and recommended. Now, right after World War I, the railroads had been taken over by the government during World War I. And the committee was very conscious of the fact that now we must do something about it. And I tell this story because we have a parallel situation today. The town of Framingham could do nothing with the railroads then because they were in suspension by the government. And we find ourselves today very desirous of doing something, but we can't because we find the railroad in bankruptcy. Yeah. So there's a pilot situation dated 75 years apart. Now, Ooh. down into that, uh, down into that um, intersection, South Framingham, there used to be a trolley line coming down Concord Street. And I remember when the Amazon building collapsed, which is before World War I, as I remember, uh, a bunch of soldiers were brought down from the muster field down to... Pratt's Plains. Yeah, yeah. They were brought down from Pratt's Plains. It was de redesignated the muster field. <laughs> Thank you. It was. But when, would, when did that trolley line disappear? Well, the trolley there, Framingham was a prominent street railroad uh, center for a number of years. The main line ran from Chestnut Hill, where it tied in with the Boston Elevator, to Worcester, where it tied in with the Worcester Consolidated. And the junction is known as the junction now because there was a local feeder line that crossed the main line there at the junction with a line running from Saxonville down Conquer Street to downtown Framingham, and at the terminal was down near the uh, fra uh, framing downtown common. There was another line that ran up Union Avenue, and the cars would run from Union Avenue up to Framingham Center. And there was a turnout at what I'm going to refer to as the cattle show grounds, which is now Bowditch Field. And the cars coming and going would have to wait there to pass each other. But there's an interesting story in connection with the muster field and the railroad. At the time of the Salem fire in 1914, when the guard was called out, the supplies were all transported from Framingham to Salem over the Boston Worcester Street Railroad, over the Boston elevator, and somewhere down around Haymarket Square in Boston, they must have made a transfer onto the Eastern Massachusetts Railroad, a street railroad line, to get the uh, supplies into uh, Salem. Now, to, to your original story about the collapse of the building in downtown Framingham, 
The 9th Infantry was on duty at the muster field at that time. And I, as I remember it, there were nine or ten Framingham residents uh, killed when that building collapsed. And one of the men was Father Maskey's brother, who was the pastor, and I think he established the St. Tarsus' Church uh, here in Framingham. And at that same period, uh, there was a unit of what is now the National Guard here in Framingham. It was E Company of the 6th Massachusetts. And that outfit was precepted by the selectmen. And they did duty in downtown Framingham for a period of approximately uh, seven or eight days. Now, I can't remember the Guard being called out on similar duty to the storms in 1938, and again the 52-53 tornado in the Worcester area when we were on duty up in Worcester for over 17 days. Yeah. Now, that Bowditch Field, uh, was that what you were going to speak about concerning Bowditch? Was well, it some other political, interesting polit political... Bowditch uh, Field item? was the cattle show ground. For a long time, there was the Middlesex, and I may not have the name straight because I'm not as old as Mr. Ablondi, but there was the... Excuse me, but I, these other gentlemen I know probably played football, different things at Bowditch Field. I'd like them to comment on what you have to say about it. Well, it was the... Originally, it was the agricultural fairgrounds, but it was known, I think, to the kids of that day as the cattle show grounds. Right. And there was a big exhibition hall across from where the field house is today that's now used as a parking area facing out on a Perini's uh, office building. And alongside of the track, what is now the track, was the grandstand for the uh, horse racing. And we had our agricultural fair up there, just the same as some of the communities in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont still run these, uh, these uh, shows. But back, if for some reason the, the uh, fair went out of business, and back in 1925, I think John Merriam was the moderator at that time. Carl can correct me on that, but I, John was mer a moderator for a good many years. He appointed a committee of uh, uh, Doc Regan, and Doc, I think, may have been a football coach in your right. day, wasn't he, Carl? Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, John Butterworth, who ran the greenhouse where St. Stephen's Church is today, and uh, Ray Callahan, that we all remember, uh -huh. and Ed Bement, who lived up on uh, State Street. I think Justin McCarty is living yeah, in that right. house today. And uh, Peter can describe a knew her better than I do. I think it was the first active. Well, there was another lady that was active in politics here in 1920, Josie Collins and her dry goods store up in Framingham Center. She was but the Framingham's first woman suffragette. And uh, what is her name again? Josie Collins. Josephine Collins, whose brother ran the meat market in Framingham Center, near the old Central House. The Collins family were an old Framingham Center family. And uh, she was very active during uh, President Wilson's campaign, marched in Boston in protest when he came to Boston. Uh, during his campaign, and then when he came to Boston during the war. And uh, uh, I can't verify the fact, but I think that she had, she was taken in custody by the police, and whether she was actually put in a cell or not, but she was taken to the police station for disturbing the peace. <laughs> and she was very proud and happy of that. She used to talk about it, that she was going to uh, fight for women's uh, suffrage. Well, Peter, there was another lady that was active in the uh, establishment of Bowditch Field, and that was Josephine Blakey. Josephine Blakey, another uh, maiden lady who uh, lived on Worcester Road, uh, just about where the uh, restaurant is now, just Wh short of Oak Road. What was her interest in Bowditch Field? Uh, active with youth. Matter of fact, uh, she was a member of St. Bridget's Church and uh, uh, donated the uh, organ, which at that time was a fantastic amount of ten thousand uh, dollars. Excuse me for the altar. And uh, uh, apparently had uh, some wealth, and she was very conscious of uh, the ruffians that lived in Framingham Center, especially those that attended St. Bridget's Church. And she did all she could to uh, see to it that we addressed people politely, we dressed well, 
uh, and I, of course I'm facetious when I say this, but uh, uh, she had great pride in the youth of Framingham. Mm -hmm. all out. Petey, you're not referring to present company in any uh, manner, are you? No. No, no. I'd like to add to what Ralph said about... Uh, no ruffians here. ...about Bowditch Field. Also at Bowditch Field was a Middlesex tuberculosis sanitarium ran an outside place for the children with tuberculosis, and they had uh, uh, wooden walls. They didn't have any windows, and then when the weather was good, they would raise the sides of the building, which would shield it from the sun and the rain. And I don't know the basis under which the, the children were selected to go there, but it was known then as a Middlesex tuberculosis uh, and, and health sanitarium or something okay. like that. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to add, uh, I guess what, one, one little bit to finish here. That, those stands at Bowditch Field were a WPA project which uh, uh, Ray Callahan was very instrumental in bringing to Framingham with the aid of the congressman who at the time lived in Waltham, and I don't recall his name. I'd like to add one part about a little bit up the road on Mont Wade Avenue is the Mont Wade section where they used to run Chautauquas, uh, which was a, an educational outdoor meeting. And my father took me there to hear William Jennings Bryan. And it was a thing that I won't forget. There were no speakers or amplifiers in those days, but you could hear them in the back rows with the, the string tie and the fancy collar and the high hat. It was quite an imposing sight. <laughs> That's good. Steve, can yes. we go back to the uh, playground for a, a minute? Uh, <coughs> and about, I think, about its field? Well, I want to tie it in as to how we got up to Bowditch Field. And my earliest recollections of the football games particularly were down on the Grand Street uh, playground, what is now the, the Butterworth Field. And I can remember going down in those days to see people like Ken Crotty and Billy Wise and uh, Ralph Hondon. And then uh, they, uh, the most famous football game in my memory, and Kyle can check me out on this, was the 23 game that was played up on Pratt's Plains, where the state police barracks and state police academy is today. And that was the year that Framingham defeated Natick 53 to nothing. And from there on, it went to... Uh, then it became then it became a military field. Right. Well, mm -hmm. it was part it was part of the military field at that time. But I think it was about your time, <coughs> Carl, when the first games were played up at uh, at what is now Bowditch Field, because I can remember playing there in '27. That's right. It was just about then that they they opened up the field, and uh, we we practiced and played up there, and then they had the half mile track uh, around there because I was running in the quarter mile. And we had the old wooden stands that were replaced by what Andy uh, said uh, on the WPA stands, and I guess the, that was about your time, wasn't it, Primo? Right. Yeah. It was Steve, after Roosevelt. We're talking about Bowditch Field. Yeah. Uh, I've got to yes. get this in because Ralph reminds me something that I think a lot of people don't know, and it would be a bit of time to go back into Birmingham's history. Bowditch Field was named after a very prominent Birmingham Center resident. There were three brothers, the Bowditch family. They ran the Millwood Farms. And uh, so I asked myself the question, well, now, prior to Bowditch Field, where was the athletic field for the Framingham school system? Well, the high school of the era up until World War I was Framingham Center. The present site of the Jonathan Maynard School is the site of the old original high school. And interestingly enough, the old high school building still stands. And that is now the Jay Gordon building in Framingham Center, the wooden building, which was moved instead of being destroyed across the meadow and back and put on its present location. Well, when the high school was at Framingham Center, the Framingham Center Common was the playground for the school system of Framingham. And the interesting story about that, when you look at the Common today, you say, well, why isn't it used as a, an athletic field? Well, because of the early ruffians, and I get back to that era now, the flagpole used to be about in the center of the common. In uh, the late teens, uh, the old uh, Unitarian wooden church burned down. So the members of the church, desirous of building a new one, hired Charlie Baker as the architect. And they have that beautiful brick church there now. 
But being an architect and a man of uh, uh, sensitivity, he wanted to dress up the Framingham Center Common. And he had to get rid of that rowdy crowd playing baseball. So they conceived the idea, let's relocate the flagpole and we'll drive the boys off. And that's what happened. <laughs> Put the, the flagpole pitches, then was in center field. And the new location found the flagpole right behind pitcher's box. And by that little move, no longer could the comma be used as a flagpole. <laughs> Peter, there was more than one attempt made to remove the flagpole, and you know that, and sure. I know that. And, and, and let me add that the good Lord made two attempts when he struck it by lightning a couple of times. Remember, it was, That's it was, right. it was shattered. That's twice as high as it is now. Yeah, it's it was shattered by a, light, by a bolt of lightning. Yeah. And, Steve and that helped in the relocation. Okay, we're going to have to start uh, uh, wrapping it up here. Um, there were some, were there some momentous changes, excuse me, uh, uh, was there, in, in town meetings, the, the form of town meetings, uh, maybe yes, John well, can, I, I well, just briefly, and then we want to wrap up, and, well, and I'm going to ask each person for a... Moderator, the, uh, when I was moderator, the town voted then to go into the limited form of town meeting and <laughs> through a legislative act, and uh, at that particular time when we were running for office, uh, I had competition, and uh, it was quite a uh, vicious fight as far as the newspapers are concerned, but not as far as the results. But uh, uh, I was elected on uh, Monday, sworn in on Tuesday, and then I sat down with Bill Waltz, and we drew up the rules and regulations for the conduct of the annual town meeting, which took place on the following uh, week from the following Wednesday. And so that we went into a representative form of town meeting from an unlimited form uh, and adopted those rules and regulations and with some minor changes that we've been going uh, ever since as a limited town meeting. Mm -hmm. But before that was unlimited and uh, it used to be interesting getting a, a, uh, a count. Yeah, that'll be a big issue from, from now on. I think Charles can tell you where the town meetings used to be held prior to being held in Nevins Hall. The casino. The casino, yeah. It was a dance The ball. casino yeah. after the village hall. Well, yeah, the, the casino, yeah. and then they we used to we used to have to schedule the town meetings between wrestling matches. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting things Steve, we could go on with. The casino was over on uh, Apollo Street. I think yeah. the Elm. Yeah, Elm Street. Yeah. 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 Thanks for yeah. identifying that. Yeah. 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 Well, I'd like to yeah. work this in for just a second. Sure, that's yeah. sort of a wrap-up thing. Yeah. Uh, yes, now, on the, on the town meeting that... Uh, uh, Mr. Sheridan refers to, uh, there was a considerable amount of debate before we changed. There were those who said you could arrange votes between precincts with a limited town meeting, you could more easily control, whereas with the old town meeting, even though you couldn't get all the voters in the town into the hall at one time, you could get people who were interested who would come down. As it is now, uh, it is very sparse attendance. And uh, once in a while, on zoning matters, you'll find somebody from precinct one example will say to the, for example, will say to the people in precinct seven, "Now look, you vote with us on this, and we'll vote with you when you ha need it." But the old town meeting, you couldn't have done that. You could have just jam-packed it with the people who were interested, except that. With 30,000 voters here, there's no place to put them. Yeah, thanks. Now, the one that, uh, uh, certainly, uh, Steve, the one difference today, uh, right now we're very conscious of the uh, cost of our street lighting. The town of Framingham today faces a yearly bill of close to $250,000 to light our streets. Well, interestingly enough, back in the days of 50 and 75 years ago, an article had to be entered into the warrant if somebody desired a light to be put either on their street or in front of their house. And you had to go down and petition the rest of the town meeting to vote the appropriation so that you might enjoy the benefit of a street light. Hey, isn't that interesting? That's great. Uh, Mr. Murtaugh. Well, I, I like the old town meeting is that I think that more people went to the town meeting and they felt more free to speak. Now that many people go and they don't feel as though they have the right to speak, the only town meeting members can speak, but that is not so. They have a right to speak, but many people do not know this. I like yeah. the old town meetings. <laughs> yeah. How about Mr. Silver? Changing oh, yeah. town meetings? 
uh, change of town meetings, I feel that the change of town meetings was tremendous because uh, you do get a vote and you know uh, immediately what, uh, what your results are. Uh, at town meetings, sometimes it is frustrating, and, uh, and, uh, uh, but this is the proper way. People have talked about changing the form of government. I personally feel that I like this form of government, even though it may drag it out. I think that more people get involved in this type of government, and this type, this is the type of government I think we need today. Yeah. That's like when Mr. Blondie referred to ruffians, you know. It was he controlling his ruffians that made the, the citizens of tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, the most interesting meeting I ever attended in Framingham was not a town meeting. But the memorial building was jammed with better than 2,000 people when an attempt was being made to remove the chief of the fire department, and his name was Colter. And I don't remember the details of the charges that were made against the chief, but he was backed up by a barrage of prominent attorneys. William, William R. Shot. From Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, Coulter, I think, was vindicated, Andy, as I remember yeah, it. But he the, the citizens of the town had their say that night, pro and con. And it was as interesting a meeting as I ever attended in this town. Very good. Mr. Sheridan, why don't you uh, have a last say in the wrap-up? You're at the middle here, for so. Let me, let me interject here. You, you kind of neglected the schools in this, and we spent $20 million. But uh, that's up to you. Thank you. We, I'm afraid we neglected a lot of it. But yeah. thank you. <laughs> well, I think, I think the, the future of Framingham is depending upon the people who take an interest and will attend town meeting as town meeting representatives. Uh, where I, I, I'd seen this sense of tendency of uh, people being a little bit uh, uh, careless about uh, how they spend their money and then complain about the amount of their taxes. It's quite a job to administer these departments and keep the expenses down with all the services the people demand. However, it's, we're no different than, than any other community as to what we need and what we desire. And uh, But I think that the whole thing is that we don't mind spending money, but we hate to waste it. And if you use, use that basis, uh, I think you'll continue to have good government in Framingham. And the, now the schools, thanks Mr. Sheridan, the schools, uh, Mr. Anderson interjected, I think the schools and Bowditch Field were closely connected. I'm surprised yeah. you didn't jump in there. Well, and, it, it, and do I have time to make one just, statement? Just a, yeah, well, one. you see the schools generally are governed by the population. They're generally one-fourth the population are school-aged children. And we've gone from about 7,500 to nearly 75,000, so that the budget of course, has increased by 10 times, in, uh, not including the inflation. And the school administration and the school committee is painfully aware of how much we cost. But we do have 22 buildings where we used to have seven. And the uh, people look at the school costs in, in that pie that the finance uh, committee puts out and shows that we have more than 50% of the budget. And when they want it cut, they go to the people who spend the most money. And it's a problem, and we're facing it as best we can with the aid of the Finance Committee and the Administration and the School Committee. Thank you very much. I know all you gentlemen have added tremendously to the uh, growth of the town, the interest of people in the town, and served very remarkably well on many committees throughout the years. And I'm sure the citizens of the future that get to see this videotape will appreciate uh, the comments you've made on various things and just wish that we had had more time to uh, mention everything that has happened in the town in the last 100 years. Thank you very much, gentlemen.